Please join me in welcoming Kalela, who will introduce today. And I'm very pleased to be introducing Professor Maria Olausen, uh, both because she is a comparatist and an English scholar, post colonial studies literary scholar, but also because she is the guest of the African Feminist Initiative. Um, which is directed by Alicia Decker and then and myself, uh, in cooperation with the Comparative Literature Luncheon Series. So, um, a very, very warm welcome to, to Maria for that reason. Um, Maria is an example of why it is that all of you who are graduate students, postdocs, in the beginning of your academic career, please be good to your friend. <laughs> Murray and I have known each other for 20 years when I was a graduate student and she was a, a whole world, very prestigious postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Cape Town. And she has been a, a generous interlocutor, um, feminist literary theory and African literature. And, um, and I have benefited enormously from the conversations we've had. I've also watched her three-year-old son become a graduate student now <laughs> at Linshaw University. In Sweden. So yes, be good to your friends and nurture these friendships. Uh, about Professor Olausen, who is Professor of English at the University of Gothenburg, she is the author of a groundbreaking study on a very important um, African novelist and political theorist, Bessie Head. Uh, her book on Bessie Head is Forceful Creation in Harsh Terrain. And uh, was based on extensive archival research in the Sorori archives of, of Head's um, letters and, and papers. And Maria is also the author of a book of feminist criticism called Three Types of Feminist Criticism and Jean Reese's Wild Sargasso Sea. And then a project that she and I were both involved in, her as a director and editor, uh, is a, a very timely collection published in 2010 called Africa Writing Europe. I think provides a, I think a very necessary corrective to the idea that it is Africa who is always the object of study, but Africa as the initiator of intellectual inquiry aimed also at the metropole, so very excitingly um, addressed in this collection. Her current project is uh, in the field of animal studies, feminist animal studies, and um, called Narrating the Animal Subject, Concurrences in Narrative Strategy. Uh, today, however, uh, and especially for those of us who, who are very interested in the under-discussed currents of African feminist <coughs> thought, is going to talk with us about one of the best-known uh, literary figures born of the African continent, but whether she is an African writer is perhaps something we can, we can talk about in the discussion. And this, of course, is about Doris Lessing. And um, uh, Professor Olausen's talk today is Helpless Against the Tides, the Spirit of the Times in Doris Lessing's Autobiographies. And over to Professor Olausen. Thank you very, very much, Abiba. Um, I'm very honored and very pleased. It's gr great, with great excitement that I come to Penn State. I've heard very much about this university. And of course, it's gloriously beautiful at this time of year. I cannot stop looking at all the trees and all the colors. So this is a very great opportunity. And I'm very, very honored to be speaking at this seminar. So thank you very much, Shant, and many, many thanks to Habiba for inviting me. Uh, about Doris Lessing in an African feminist initiative. Yes, I agree. This is like a double or maybe triple irony that Doris Lessing would maybe not have seen herself as an Africanist. She would certainly refuse to see herself as a feminist. And that is sort of also the topic of my talk and many of questions that I have been thinking of for very many years now, uh, sort of things that I bring up in this paper. And that is why I'm really genuinely particularly interested then in the question and answer session for those of you who are also familiar with Doris Lessing and might have some ideas about these sort of questions and, and strange ironies of, of Lessing's authorship, but also of her essays and particularly about the things that she writes about in her autobiographies. 
Now, this talk is inspired by a recent project where I was invited to join a number of Swedish feminist scholars, journalists and authors who all wanted to reflect on their experiences and readings of Doris Lessing. Like many other women in Western Europe, this group shares a history of being deeply influenced by Doris Lessing's novels when reading them in the 1970s and 1980s. And this project is also part of a general trend in Sweden today where feminists of the 1970s are actually now putting their experiences and reflections together in books and sort of bring them out into print for another generation. Because there is now a new generation of Swedish young women, a new generation of feminists who are very, very vibrant and very active and doing new and wonderful things that we might not really know very much about or that we are able to relate to. So my reflections <coughs> and the question of what uh, Doris Lessing calls the spirit of the times is part of this reflection of the idea of generations in feminist studies. What happens? What are the ideas and the thoughts that we would very much like to give on to new gen generations of women? And why is it that these ideas may not be picked up. Maybe totally different ideas and thought patterns develop from our activities and from our thinking. And this is what happened to Doris Lessing, I argue. For many women in Scandinavia, the experience of reading Doris Lessing in the late 1970s somehow created the impression that what we were reading about was a depiction of the student revolt of 1968 or the feminist or leftist movement of the 1970s in the United States and, and Western Europe. Because Scandinavia, as you might know, is slightly on the margins of everything. So things sort of come there, but a bit later. So really, we were thinking that, you know, she is now in the midst of all these exciting things happening and she is writing about that. But Doris Lessing she was born in 1919. She was born in Persia, which does not exist anymore as a country. It's now Iran. She moved to another country, southern Rhodesia, which does not exist anymore. It's called Zimbabwe now. She moved there when she was five years old with her parents. There she grew up on a farm. Then she moved to the capital of <coughs> Salisbury. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it's called Harare, where she lived during the time of the Second World War. This is what she's writing about. She then married a civil servant, had two children, but left this family to join a group of leftist revolutionaries. She married a German refugee at this time of the Second World War, which was not very easy to do, and had a son. <coughs> she moved to London already in 1949. And there she carried with her her small son and the manuscript of her first novel, The Grass is Singing, and then, you know, approached the publisher, immediately found a publisher, and the book was a great success. And she took this for granted. She didn't know that authors were supposed to be struggling. She then continued with her political activism and officially joined the Communist Party, which she says was the most neurotic act of her life. And, but she left the party very soon. She left with the Soviet invasion of, of Hungary in 1956. She then continued to work with anti-apartheid movements and the movement for nuclear disarmament. But most of her time was devoted to writing and she published more than 20 novels and equal numbers of uh, collections of short stories, memoirs and collections of essays and works of nonfiction. And in 2007, at the age of 88, she was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. And then in 2013, she passed away. What strikes me as particularly interesting now is 
the fact that Lessing, of course, wrote about a political activism of the 1940s and that all her novels deal with this experience from the point of view of someone who wants to distance herself from these activities. Uh, but nevertheless, she writes about her involvement in the anti-colonial struggle in southern Rhodesia and about her life as communist in London with such intensity and passion that it actually inspired a whole generation of new activists in the 1960s and 70s. The most perplexing aspect of this concerns the question of feminist activism. Both the Martha Quest series, based on her life as a young girl and then a young woman growing up in Southern Africa, and the very famous novel, The Golden Notebook, which appeared in 1962, take a woman's perspective as self-evident. And it articulates a refusal to live the conventional life of a settler in colonial South Africa. And this does in, in a very quite extraordinary and part-breaking ways. When people pointed that out to her, that she's actually describing the life of a woman in a way that has never been described before, her comment was, well, apparently, what many women were thinking and feeling came as a great surprise. But she didn't really want to, to deal with that. But, and when her autobiographies, Under My Skin and Walking in the Light, appeared in 1994 and 1997, many Lessing scholars noted with great sadness and confusion how violently Lessing actually expressed her antipathy to feminist activism. In one review, uh, Ellen Cronin Rose, in, uh, Rose wrote in the Women's Review of Books, and I quote, I belong to a generation of women scholars, feminist scholars, who devoted our professional lives to studying and writing about Doris Lessing because she wrote intelligently about what it was like to be a woman. How can I preserve my Doris Lessing, the author of books that inspired me and many other women to regard ourselves as thinking, feeling, political, sensual subjects, not just objects of men's desires and fantasies, from being modified or tainted by the ungenerous, worse, unintelligent, griping of the querulous woman who is writing this autobiography. She was very angry. In this talk, I would like to approach this contradiction by focusing on a particular aspect in Lessing's autobiographies that she calls the zeitgeist or the spirit of the times. And she keeps returning to this in an effort to explain what she calls how we were thinking. An important aspect of this zeitgeist is expressed in the quote that I use as a title for my talk, where she says that we are helpless against the tides. And the whole quote is, goes like this. In my life, I have again and again observed masses of people being carried this way and that by emotion with as much chance of saying no as fishes in a flood. Not only what we have observed tell us that we are helpless against the tides. Experiments in universities confirm the same thing. These thoughts were, this is from her autobiography, but these thoughts were present in a much stronger form already in the Massey Lectures delivered in Canada in 1985 and published as Prisons We Choose to Live Inside in 1987. Here, Lessing describes political activism as part of the phenomenon of mass movements <coughs> and sees radically different manifestations of the human tendency to be inspired by others and to sometimes unreflectingly be possessed by great ideas as all very dangerous and very undesirable. 
Young people, she argues, are inevitable in, uh, inevitably in danger. And this is what she writes. Perhaps it is not too much to say that in these violent times, the kindest, wisest wish we have for the young must be, we hope that your period of immersion in group lunacy, group self-righteousness, self will not coincide with some period of your country's history where you can put your murderous, stupid ideas into practice. This is the kindest and wisest wish she has for young people. Now, this was written in 1985, and it is, of course, if you look at the world as it stands, hard to deny that, you know, many times uh, misguided young people do, in fact, put murderous ideas into practice. And this might be an apt description of the minority of the world's misguided youth. But the question still remains why Doris Lessing ended up presenting her own political work against an unjust and oppressive political system in southern Africa in these terms. And why she so strongly objected to see her own hard-won independence as an inspiration for other women. It is rather extraordinary that she immediately creates this connection between, between extremist groups that actually go out and kill people, and that she sort of incorporates that within an idea of any type of movement for change. Now, if you look at this within the context of the communist ideology of the 1940s, one might see Lessing's hostility to feminism as part of that ideology's conviction that any preoccupation with women's concerns was a reflection of bourgeois or even of a decadent lifestyle. While many of her comments certainly reflect that position, because throughout her autobiography she talks about the, the women's movement that she did not understand, and it is in a tone of sort of dismissal. This is sort of pity and this is um, uh, decadent. It still does not explain why she would criticize so many and most aspects of these political conviction and still remain anti-feminist. So after all, communism also had deeply puritanical views of sexuality and Lessing was not puritanical. She, as a matter of principle, she includes a lot of descriptions of female sexuality in quite path-breaking ways in her writing. Uh, also part of communist uh, ideas was that any new forms of literature and art had to be devoted to a re revolutionary cause, but Lessing and her friends read a wide variety of novels and literature, and they were perfectly capable of discriminating between art and propaganda. Lessing explores mysticism as well as Jungian and Freudian psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic thought, and that was also seen as very suspicious. So she was able to break a lot of um, ideas from the Communist Party line, um, but she did not want to go into the exploration of feminist concerns. I argue instead that one possible answer to these questions might be found in the formal structure of the autobiographies, and particularly in the way that these link. Lessing's description of the mother-daughter struggle, where she tries to come to terms with her own relation to her mother, this is now a generational issue that is sort of being brought into a larger question of generations, and her efforts at making us readers understand the spirit of the times of her political conviction. These similarities between these two struggles are rhetorical, and Lessing uses a structure in three parts. 
First she describes the events, then she describes her reactions and thoughts to these events, and finally she adds a third level of commentary, where she tells readers not to pass judgment on these thoughts and reactions of the past. So this becomes very confusing for the reader, I must say. And the, the last section, the, the last um, part that she adds, these comments are sometimes very lengthy, and there she sometimes invents younger people who come to her, and she invents what they are supposed to say and how they are supposed to criticize her. And it's always someone of a younger generation who does not understand the spirit of the times. Another review of the autobiographies by Jane Miller, um, in much the same way as Ellen Cronin Rose, in the review that I quoted previously, expresses her disappointment at Lessing's lack of sympathy for feminist concerns, but concludes by pointing to the way um, Lessing, as an established author living in London, struggled to secure her time and space for writing. This identity as an author that Lessing wants to preserve, <coughs> after having spent her girlhood in flight from the expectations and wishes of her mother, and then later, uh, after trying to sort of get away from the demands of political activism, and in this context, Miller uh, refers to the disappointment of the feminists and has a very interesting observation. She concludes that maybe we are all her mother in some degree. So instead of seeing this generational thing as, you know, Lessing, Doris Lessing being the mother and we are the daughters supposed to inherit, maybe we are her mother. Here, she also refers to people with demands on her time. Another formal aspect of the autobiogra autobiographies concerns the emergence of the individual. The strong warning against mass movements described as prisons we choose to live inside in the lectures express a strong dislike for what Lessing actually articulates as animalistic tendencies in humans. We have to be very careful, <coughs> otherwise we become part of a pack and we are influenced by our emotions and we get carried away. You know, remember the fish? And um, so we have to be very careful, otherwise we're carried away by emotion rather than reason. Now, if you think about this and look at the form and structure of the autobiographies, where aspects of relation and belonging are often set aside to stress and foreground the emergence of an individual um, in the context, but also in opposition to surrounding people and events. As many scholars of autobiography, have, as Chandra have pointed out, this, this actually follows the conventions of uh, the generic conventions of a male-dominated classical Western autobiography. So the emergence of the individual in Lessing's text even stronger than usual, in the sense that she comments on her own deep involvement in the spirit of the times, but then steps back in an effort to explain and to justify this immersion. So she sees herself as someone who was not sort of emerging as an individual, she was part of the spirit of the times, but in her autobiographies, she apologizes for this in very strong terms. About the time before the Second World War, for instance, in southern Rhodesia, she writes, we are sensation junkies, predisposed to excitement. And if that means danger and death, we are ready for it. Every generation has been talked into war by the nostalgic voices from the one before. All that year, 1939, I was dreaming of rushing off the moment war was declared to be a nurse, a soldier, a parachute jumper into enemy territory, a spy for my country, an ambulance driver. And also in this context, she reflects 
on the whole experience she has of growing up in colonial southern Rhodesia, and that she describes it like this. The undertow, a feeling of being dragged or propelled, of not being myself, of long ago having lost control, that was as strong an emotion as I ever have ever felt. Her refusal to be dragged into this society of racist conventionality is most clearly expressed through a refusal to live up to the expectation of her mother. And the mother-daughter conflict is described with the same ambivalence that we can find in Lessing's insightful depictions of her life as an activist and an independent woman. First, there is this vivid description of the conflict then it's followed by a distancing comments on the attitudes and thoughts and feelings of the young woman. And then she adds this third and additional layer of fictive conversations where Lessing imagines younger people to be critical observers and have critical objections and often ends up taking the sides of her mother in an effort to stress the importance of understanding the spirit of the times. She says, for instance, when she has just described the snobbery of her mother, the way the mother treated the servants, and uh, you know something that you can only agree with, that any one of us would be very upset by. Then she writes like this, to write about all of it now. The terrible snobbery of the time is to invite, well, what of it? That was then, it was that time. But if the vocabulary of snobbery has changed, its structure has not. And the same mechanisms operate now, while people laugh, mindlessly, I think, about the old days. So there she sort of, in a way, she then goes in and um, supports the mother. This ambivalence is continued in the second part of the autobiography, where Lessing describes her life in London. At this point, she had moved from the farm into Salisbury, married, had two children, left her family, married the German um, uh, prisoner of war, and moved with the small, had another child and moved with the small boy to London. All through the depiction of these events, the mother is present only as a raging but tragic figure in the margins, almost comical in her insistence on forms of middle-class conventionality in the midst of her daughter's increasingly unconventional life. The move to London is, in the estimation of the daughter, planned as a final and definite escape from the mother. But as Lessing points out later when she writes her autobiographies, she says, well, it was precisely a life back in Britain that the, her mother had longed for during all her years in Africa. And of course, soon the mother writes and tells of her arrival. And now there arrived a letter from my mother saying she was coming to London. She was going to live with me and help me with Peter. And here was the inevitable, surreal, heartbreaking ingredient. She had taught herself typing and would be my secretary. In the same way as in the first part of the autobiography, Lessing here first focuses on the thoughts and reactions of the young Doris Lessing. She describes her desperation, her absolute refusal, opposition to the plans of her mother, all her discussions with her friends, and their strong advice against letting the mother invade her life once again. And then, only in what appears as a form of unintentional admission, Lessing lets the mother somehow creep into the narrative again. Far from what the reader would expect from these strong objections, the mother does arrive in London. She takes up an important role as grandmother to the young boy. She completely takes over his education. She has him baptized and insists on him going to church. And she provides educational opportunities that are designed to diffuse some of the communist influence of Doris Lessing and her friends. 
But in Lessing's descriptions, the focus on the strong opposition to the mother creates the impression that Doris Lessing did in fact confront the mother or somehow succeed in sticking to her own plans. But only a very <coughs> observant reader can um, notice that Lessing admits there was never a confrontation. The mother succeeded in carrying out all her plans. She says, I didn't even argue. There was never any point. Now this rhetoric of ambivalence and inevitability is repeated, exactly repeated in the rhetorical structure in Lessing's depictions of her experience of being part of a political movement. The additional dimension of meta-commentary is also present when she upbraids the readers for passing judgment on something they were not part of and that they therefore are not able to understand. And one of the most important political questions concern the British Empire and the presence of British settlers in Southern Africa. In her political involvement against the politics of white supremacy and the ideas of empire, Lessing turns against her family, she turns against the values and expectations of her mother, but in the autobiographical account itself, it involves an engagement with this part of her family and family history where Lessing actually refuses to articulate a critique in her own voice. But instead, she again, she invents a fictive opponent whom she then upbraids for not understanding the spirit of the times. She talks about her parents' decision, for instance, to move to and start farming in southern Rhodesia. And then she says, it would not have occurred to them that the land belonged to the Africans. Civilization was brought to the savages. That's how they saw it. Because the British Empire was a boon and a benefit to the whole world. I do not think it can be said too often that it is a mistake to exclaim over past wrong thinking before at least pondering how our present thinking will seem to posterity. Um, and the most remarkable aspect of Lessing's attitude towards the British Empire does not in fact consist in any doubt about the fact that the colonies needed to be replaced by democratically elected governments, but in her consistent and exclusive focus on European culture whenever she discusses literature, art and music. And those of you who remember or have come across her Nobel speech, this is of course particularly and painfully evident because here she imagines a young African woman victimized by poverty and struggling to feed herself and her children who is coming to a rural village shop where some um, aid organizations are just about to arrive to bring food. And in this rural shop, the young African woman finds remains of the novel Anna Karenina and manages to quench her thirst for culture and learning by holding on and voraciously reading the remains of this European presence. And Doris Lessing imagines this being set in the present time. So this is really highly disturbing. So the political struggle that Lessing against the British Empire that Lessing describes in her novels and in her autobiography can therefore actually be understood as a protest against a system that did not make the fruits of European learning and European culture available uh, to all. And to a certain extent that of course can be seen as an extension of her parents' attitudes uh, or the attitudes of the parents' generation rather than a radical break for, for it, from it. Okay, to wrap up, I will now uh, say that the rhetorical strategies that we have seen here at work of ambivalence and meta-commentary are present then in the talk of her parents, in the talk of her mother and in the talk of, of her political activism. I will give you one example uh, of how it works with the um, 
political activism, instead of imagining young people coming to her work and reading it and being inspired by it, she invents a completely different commentary. Um, she says like this, when young people look at you with ironical and amazed eyes and even say, but I've never been able to understand. What they are not understanding is that it is impossible to distance oneself from the strong currents of one's time. Their children and grandchildren will look at them and say primly, but I simply cannot understand. It is quite remarkable and actually quite sad that Lessing invites a younger generation that passes judgment on her instead of actually seeing the generation of younger women that were there right in front of her eyes, who were full of interest and admiration and saw her as a role model. In her need to distance herself from these critical voices, she also missed out on the opportunity to tell a different story, a story that would focus more on the actual and very real causes behind the political work in colonial Southern Africa. She, her interest seems to be directed at finding a way of articulating something of a more general concern that is connected to the possibilities, shortcomings of literature, memory and autobiographical writing. The depictions of the life of a free woman, she calls certain um, chapters in the Golden Notebook, The Life of a Free Woman, is not about feminist activism or feminist solidarity, they are, on the contrary, inspired by the need for a radical break from the demands of the conventional life of a woman, away from the needs of the mother, from the work of the activist, away from the needs of women, towards the freedom required for the life of the artist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for that talk. I'd like to start things off with a, I guess a bad Jungian question, if you don't mind. Uh, and it has to do, so I'm really struck by this, this rhetorical structure by which, by which you might say commitment mm. can be measured, right, according not to militancy, by which like, that's easy, mm. right? not, not by militant commitment, but by this, this structured break, right, mm. the very terms of an ideology. Mm. Structured in terms of this conflict between Zeitgeist and, and one's mother, mm. um, where like the mother becomes kind of an alien encounter, mm. <laughs> right? Uh, somehow, um, I mean, I'm, I'm really struck by the, by that by that structure, um, and I, I guess what what distinguishes what distinguishes this from, you know, I think a fairly standard avant-garde formation, mm. at least in my book, um, which is to say. Uh, uh, to avoid the automatism of commitment by f affiliation alone, mm. right? That the, the that that the mother figure here, the figuration mm. of the mother, as a as a model of commitment and agape at the same time, mm. um, is no longer like a super ego mm. somehow, right? A model of the super ego, but that needs to be you know broken with and ruptured and experimented upon, but something more like a, an, an anima, mm. right? But an anima of the same Gender, mm. right? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just wondering if so. Like, it's much. I, mean, I don't know what that figuration means. That's what I'm asking you. But uh, like no, that's very interesting. <coughs> yeah. No, I'm really. I mean, I'm very interested in any thoughts and any ideas about this. And this is certainly a very interesting idea because it's so puzzling. The whole thing is very, very puzzling. But then, I mean, in terms then of the mother figure, then would still be would still be something that exists as a mother figure. But here, I mean, the thought that I was intrigued <coughs> by was this idea that, you know, yeah, the connection then between later generations, that she can never herself inhabit that position. Yeah, so th in that way it would make sense. She can never herself inhabit that position because she always has to see, because that would mean that she would have to have a, a gen other, other generation sort of coming after her. And that, of course, doesn't happen. Right. She refuses that, that movement. So I will, uh, yes, thank you. I will think about that. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed this. And I 
and I was thinking about your position um, engaging in this, particularly in terms of feminist theory, largely, mm -hmm. and the huge feminist disappointment mm -hmm. at the position Lessig was taking. And I wondered if you weren't doing kind of a symptomatic reading of Lessig mm -hmm. as um, a type of um, double bindedness that may register beyond Lessing out into other mm -hmm. forms mm -hmm. of double bind. And I wondered if, if there was a theoretical statement mm -hmm. of feminism mm -hmm. in the kind of reading you're doing here. I don't know if uh, there's sort of a theoretical engagement. It's more, yeah, maybe in connection to the idea of generation. How do we think about feminist generation? Because I think in like the birth of the women's studies and, and the institutionalization of feminist thought and theory, um, the idea has been to look to read back through our mothers. Right. So we read back through our mothers and we sort of look at this. But it's been but we've never asked their permission, have we? <laughs> we are reading Virginia Woolf and we are reading everybody and we're picking up their thoughts and ideas. But when we did this to Lessing, she was still alive and she was so angry and she said, you know, no, this is not me. Don't do this to me. So I think this, uh, it sort of disturbs and complicates that process. And I think um, for people, at least of my generation and now the people working on this in Sweden, it's very, very, it's a very good lesson, I think. Because there are instances of people who have had enormous influence on feminist theory, on sort of have edited all these books about uh, uh, female authors in Sweden and brought out all these collections as, and are huge authorities. And suddenly, you know, younger scholars come and they do something co totally different. And these established scholars are not happy. They get very, very angry. And they said, no, you know, you don't have to bring in all those theories or you don't have to go in that direction. And this is not important because I've already done it all. <laughs> they don't put it quite like that. But it's, <laughs> it's very much that sort of attitude that, you know, generational, you know, giving things over to generational, you, you don't actually allow people to, to take what you have done and reform it. And that seems to be what happened to Lessing, and she didn't like it. So, so if I could just ask, so in your reading of Lessing, you're kind of querying generationality by flipping it, so that... Exactly, yeah. yes. Cool. Yeah, so that it's like, you know, we are her mother, and her mother was very unhappy with her. She could not understand her, and, and so Lessing never takes up that position of mother-daughter in the sort of genealogy of feminist theory and feminist readings. So I think it's the best thing is to step back and watch uh -huh. and read. <laughs> yes, <laughs> typing. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I was also going to ask a question about the relationship between feminism and feminism and Back 
through autobiography and it's it's quite tense relationship with fiction to distance herself from the specificity of her, say, political work, or even the, the kinds of choices she made during her life in Southern Africa, in order to claim that this more general space, which, as you say, is what I, I, I perceive you to be saying, a, a space into, the, into greater convention. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you can say <coughs> something about that refusal also of or the distancing also of her relationship to Africa as part of what seems to be a, a stepping back from you know, the mm. specificity of several areas of her life. Mm. Thank you, Habiba. I think that's very, very central. And it's also something that I need to think through. It's, it's very puzzling and very, um, very hard to come to terms with. One thing that I think is very, very, I think Africa is very important. I think it's absolutely central and, and I mean it's central to the way in which she imagines her life as a free woman and the way she manages to move to London and sort of set up a very unconventional life that was not circumscribed by all sorts of conventions and things. And I think that this is something that she brought with her from this sort of colonial situation where she could she could experiment with this different type of, of life and living. Um, and I think, I mean, those sort of patterns are the same and they do not involve Africa as such. They do not involve any uh, sort of connections with African women or African feminisms or African ways of living. But they are somehow born out of that particular historical moment and historical situation and cannot be seen to be somehow derivative from some sort of, I mean, there was of course an idea, an, an ideal of that being part of Europe, mm -hmm. but it isn't really. Mm -hmm. So that life then started having its own development and its own momentum. Mm -hmm. um, so to a certain extent, I think that, um, that the distance that she then creates to that life and to those choices and to, to the way she was living then, um, that they are actually, um, they actually point in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Her own insistence on that difference point in the wrong direction because I really think that it was absolutely crucial and absolutely central. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that, you know, you can only by, by looking at that specific situation and she does say in her autobiographies that she was part of the end of the British Empire in Africa. Mm -hmm. So she does acknowledge this is her historical setting, this is wha where she grew up, this, this was her life. Mm -hmm. And she's full of admiration for her mother mm -hmm. as being this capable woman, this person who was really took her children very seriously taught the children at home, imported all these books from England, and you know, she's full of admiration for that. And then she sort of, as you point out, there is this sort of second part that then comes in and, and describes her need to distance herself from all that. Mm. It's very interesting that the way she does that is through autobiography, claims back yes. um, against In terms of time, in terms of yes. space, so it's very interesting this relation you give us of how the world works against. That's very interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk. Um, another conundrum about Doris Lessing is the amount of science fiction that she wrote. Yes. <laughs> um, in fact, I can't think of another Nobel Prize for <laughs> who wrote science fiction. No. Um, and, you know, so far the discourse has been a lot about roughly realism and relation of mm -hmm. literature to reality. And I'm just wondering where you see the science fiction fitting in or connecting with any of the themes that you brought up. Mm. Uh, is this 
Uh, is this a way of disassociating herself with some of those expectations? Is it a way of rethinking generational models? Um, uh, is it a way of, of, of realigning uh, some of the, you know, some of the um, autobiographical features that you began with? Mm. Just wondering. Thank you, or yes. Places that don't exist anymore. For yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Places that don't exist yet. <laughs> yeah, thank you, yes. I think they are probably very important. My problem was that I've, I was so bored by her, uh, by her <laughs> science fiction. That's important. Yes, I think it's like, I mean, why does she suddenly, you know, after she has written all these wonderful books and you're waiting for more, then you, oh, what is this? Um, but I think you, you're probably right. It's very, very, very important. It's, it's. I'm sure it's all of the things that you mentioned. It's a way of distancing herself from ideas of, you know, what does of realist fiction, you know, the communist expectations that you have. You write certain things only to sort of for the cause. Uh, to take that to the absolute extreme, you start writing science fiction, um, and also, yeah ways of imagining things, of putting her imagination into, into the future of what things could be like. So I'm sure some, someone of another generation would be most welcome to <laughs> read all her <laughs> science fiction. <laughs> Mm. So I'm thinking here of um, a question of power, but mm. I'm thinking of the kind of strategic refu refusals of certain kinds of community mm. that reappear persistently and resistantly in mm. a question of power. Mm. And I'm also thinking of the relationship with the younger generation figured in the little boy mm. of a question of power and the notion of writing because he makes the drawing of the play. Mm. And there's this sense of a supposed motherliness in the autobiographic narrator, but then at the same time, or, or, or the, the fictional narrator, because mm. it's the narration goes back and forth. But um, I'm wondering if that, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is if we're struggling with the notion of African feminism or African feminism. It seems to me that there are some sort of very bizarre and interesting correspondences between Messing and mm. him in the strategic refusal, the relation to the youth as something that is, has youth that has its own feeling, him or her, I'll say it's because it's a very distant figure in a question. Mm. And then the notion that the youth takes over the creative process mm. and has complete freedom mm. in a way that's quite scary for the, for the author. So I, I just, you know, what I, I don't think we think about Lessing and Head in the same pocket enough due to mm. historic racism, but they do have, there, there seems to me to be some affiliation in their strategic refusals of certain kinds of community, and I wonder if you were to think. Mm, thank you. No, I think that you're absolutely right. I think there are a lot of similarities, and I think you're absolutely right in saying, I mean, we think of them as very different, but they're not. I think they're very, very similar. I mean, I think. Bessie Head, in her, I mean, she, she went into a different type of, of exile, mm -hmm. but she went to an African village, which is really extraordinary. And she couldn't communicate with the people because she never learned uh, Setswana. Mm -hmm. So she couldn't speak to them. And she was sitting in this rondavel in the hut, and there she had her typewriter, and she complained because the goats ate all her paper. Mm -hmm. And she complained about you not re really having enough paper and, you know, for her and the typewriter didn't really work and all these sort of things. And the similarities also, also about these imported books. Mm -hmm. So the sustenance and the reading they did and the, the sort of the correspondence she carried on was all with people at different, in different parts of the world. But not very, very, very few people in the village itself actually knew, you know, who she was and what she was doing and who is this woman. Yes, yes, absolutely. And she didn't, she didn't want to make friends in that manner either. So you're absolutely right. There are very many similarities. And also, um, I mean, she was, 
I, I'm also thinking of Maru and, and the teacher. Yes. The way she depicts uh, younger people, school children, as actually as monsters. Yes. Also, another th point of similarity is this idea that, I mean, Doris Lessing, she talks about the terror of Stalin, Stalinist terror, and describes it and says, I wish I could say that I would never have been part of this, that I would blah, blah, blah. And then she just ends by saying, um, talking about killing of people, she says, there by the grace of God I did not go. But in Maru there is the same idea that she actually sees herself walk up to this child in a school when she's a teacher and sort of wring the neck and kill the girl. Like a chicken. Yeah. And then she says, oh God, I'm so happy. I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Oh, I'm so glad. So there is this deep feeling of guilt, of feeling that if I'm doing something, if I get active, if I get sort of involved, I will actually end up killing people, which is really extraordinary. Mm. <laughs> one more question. Um, I want to ask you about how your kind of narrative if you look at uh, Doris Lessing going back to Zimbabwe and back to the laughter, to mm. me, it, it, it seems like her kind of pulling back from Africa is her experience of going back to Zimbabwe and being totally disillusioned with mm. what she thought was would happen of her you know, engagement in the liberation struggle and, and so mm. on, and then going to Zimbabwe and being totally disillusioned. Mm. I mean, to me, it, it seems like that, like her political tent, pulling back from communism, influenced you know, what she did after that. Mm. Yes. <coughs> yeah, thank you. I think that's probably correct. I think that because there are passages in her autobiographies where she keeps returning to, to the discussions that this leftist group had in, uh, in Salisbury, where they were discussing you know, what uh, freedom would be like. And she said, we were very, very stupid. We thought that people, by, you know, by being oppressed, they would, by necessity, then also be only you know, wonderful persons, and they would not have any base desires, and they would not sort of be misguided in any way. So she, and I'm sure that is exactly the, the reason she adds this. I mean, that comes later. So I think, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, John. Thank you for the